evolution at work. Over the tens of thousands of years, or even hundreds of thousands, that human populations have been evolving and migrating, there's a tremendous amount of movement. Now, it doesn't seem fast to us nowadays, but it seems that human populations, tribes, groups, often have the inkling or the interest in seeing what was over the next hill or across the next river. So most human populations migrated um, to many of the continents and land masses here on Earth. And as they went with them, they encountered local animals and plants, and sometimes took their own animals and plants with them, depending upon which millennia or era that we're talking about. And some of those animals and some of those microorganisms um, either established mutualistic or commensal semiotic relationships, or sometimes parasitic or pathogenic relationships. The longer the interaction, the more um, stable the interaction could be, even if it's one of parasitism. And oftentimes, even if it was an acute illness, where someone has some pretty severe, severe serious signs and symptoms, um, if they were able to survive, they often developed what we would describe as immunity that was long-term, that either prevented them from getting the disease again, or the infection again, or if they did get sick the second time with the same disease, it wasn't nearly as serious or severe. Those survivors are your ancestors. The reason that you are here today is that your ancestors managed to get through the gauntlet of all the challenges that our ancient ancestors had to live with in terms of both everyday challenges of food and shelter, but also any kind of microorganisms that they encountered. Unfortunately, along with just everyday living and trying to get enough food and water and you know security and safety and place to live, um, our ancestors have a bloody history. Human history is a bloody one, unfortunately, because armed conflict um, has been part of our prehistory and current history even today. We call that armed conflict warfare. And one of the analogies about the problems that accompany any kind of armed conflict like warfare can be seen in the concept of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The Four Horsemen, one of which was war, um, can devastate a human population, especially um, whether it's a long-term or short-term interaction or a local or worldwide occurrence. Anytime there's armed conflict or warfare amongst people, there's a loss of productivity. That's one of the key words that you'll hear pop up from time to time. It's not a really glamorous word, and it doesn't really catch everyone's attention, but that really is, to sum up, what it means when we lose the ability to take care of ourselves because we are distracted or taken away from our farms and businesses and everyday life because of the armed conflict. We're trying to survive the armed conflict, but in the meantime, the everyday activities of productivity just can't be done. And so if there's no one able to milk the cows, harvest the grain, make the cloth that you need for clothes, all of those things that we take for granted in a nonviolent or healthy, stable civilization can't be done. And that's called productivity. So the loss of productivity due to warfare often leads to famine because the food's just not there. When famine occurs, unfortunately, as the body is not nourished, then we're susceptible to the third horseman, which is pestilence. 
Now, pestilence, in ancient terms, means disease, or what we think of as infectious disease. Sometimes they even called them plagues, but nowadays, our modern terminology, the word plague actually means one specific disease or infection. But in ancient times, the word plague meant something more like what we think of as an epidemic. One disease affecting a population and causing serious loss of productivity, including inability to participate in the armed conflict. And that is part of the problem whenever armed conflict like a war is occurring, when famine occurs and pestilence occurs, those folks that are supposed to be part of the defense system can't participate because they're just too sick. When that happens, if they become too ill or subject to the onslaught of the adversaries, then the fourth horseman arrives and that's death. And unfortunately, these four aspects of armed conflict and warfare, the famine that accompanies it, and then the pestilence or diseases, what we call famine-related diseases and death, still haunt us today. They've been part of the human scenario for probably tens of thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands. Getting evidence of that is not easy. Fortunately, technology has improved tremendously in the last, even in the last few years. Um, archaeologists have been digging around in the layers of the earth and the dirt, trying to find our ancestors and evidence of the activities of Homo species and Neanderthal species. It's not all that easy, but Various technologies have definitely improved just even in the last few years. And so even if we look back to the various Stone Ages, there are roughly three ages that we call Stone Age that are recognized. Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic. They range from roughly about 2.6 million years ago to about 4,000 BC. Sometimes you'll also see the notation BCE. So BC is one way of counting the clock, if you will, of time. Um, and then we could use BCE means the same thing. Before the Common Era is what that stands for, though. The Bronze Age is roughly 4,000 to 1,200 BC. And then the Iron Age is about 1,200 to about 500 BC. Um, go visit the history dot com website and view the small short video about Iron Age and how important the discovery and the smelting of iron was to the development of, of human endeavors. For the distinction between the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic, Paleolithic we're really looking at folks who were hunter-gatherers and they lived what we would think of as a day-to-day -day existence, not really settling down in one place permanently, and following along with large herds of animals or moving with the climate or the changes in the weather. Um, a more vulnerable experience, if you will. That starts at around 2.6, 2.5 million years ago and up to roughly 15,000 years ago we get to about 15,000 years ago, we start to see changes in the remains that archaeologists find in places where habitation has occurred. And now we start to see the use of other kinds of tools. And those other tools help to improve the longevity, help to improve the stability of the groups, until we get to about 11,000 years ago, which if you can compare the timeline between the Paleolithic and Mesolithic, the time between the Mesolithic and Neolithic, pretty short. By the time we get to the Neolithic, now we're starting to see the earliest of advances in domestication of fruits, vegetables, and animals.
it takes a while, it takes probably several thousands of years for humans to really perfect those um, types of activities, but that's going to be an important point for us. <coughs> because then we're going to see the cultivation and the stability that we take for granted today in terms of constant sources of food, constant productivity, and safe places to live. If we take a look at human migration, this is a fairly busy map, but if you just look at some of the arrows, and especially the colored arrows, you can start to see that the migration out of Africa, which has now been well established through studies of ancient genetic material, as well as archaeological remains that's found in those locales, that we have tens of thousands of years of human beings slowly but surely advancing to almost every continent on Earth, with the exception of perhaps the Antarctic. When you get a chance, take a look at the National Geographic um, website that's linked to that URL at the bottom of the slide to see and find more information about human migration. The fact that there was a lot of movement, remember, everything goes with them. Not only their material goods, but their invisible microorganisms as well. And of course, Part of the mechanisms that are affecting how humans survive and pass along the more beneficial conditions of their life is through that mechanism we call evolution. When we have changes in geographic locations or perhaps barriers that rise up, rivers, mountains, snow, avalanche, glaciers, um, then we start to see a separation of populations and we see changes in what's called the stability of both the human beings as well as the microorganisms that live in and on their body. Those populations of microorganisms are called microbiomes. And in fact, if we take a look at the population of microbes living on your feet, they're going to be different than the microbes living on the tip of your nose. And those differences can lead to different levels of protection. We call those differing levels of immunity as well, because your immune system also interacts with those microorganisms. There are various types of other critters or other organisms, as well as microorganisms, that our bodies interact with and our ancestors' bodies interacted with that include insects, like mites, fleas, ticks, and flies, and mosquitoes, and spiders, as well as animals, like worms, especially worms that could become parasitic and live inside of our body, along with microorganisms that can be found in different categories that we call protozoa and fungi, as well as bacteria, which most people have heard about, as well as viruses. That most folks have heard about. Many parasites were probably acquired um, slowly but surely as our ancestors migrated from one place to another. And there's some strong evidence for that in some, again, of the genetic studies that have been done now determining relatedness of different microorganisms or where they tend to be found even today, as well as in the archaeologic remains of the skeletons that's usually the only source of information that we have about our ancestors today. If we take a look at some of the ancient DNA that's now extracted from those ancient skeletal remains, they tell us a lot not only about the, the person, but also the types of microbiomes or microorganisms that lived with the person. For the most part, our ancient ancestors often occupied what we call temperate or tropical climates, the easy-to-live places. Now, that's not exclusive, and there were populations of humans, or Neanderthals even, that, for whatever reason, we don't know for sure now, but we can speculate, 
um, may, maybe for security reasons, um, perhaps they colonized or they occupied and lived in places that were um, weather-wise or climate-wise more challenging. But many humans and Neanderthals did occupy temperate and tropical areas on Earth because it was just easier to live there. Um, the sources of food were more um, readily accessible, as well as establishing sort of comfortable living conditions. And of course, in those parts of the world where we have temperate and tropical forests and t tropical and temperate um, environments, we have a huge diversity of organisms, both visible, like plants and animals, as well as invisible, the microorganisms. And for the most part, slowly but surely, those areas didn't pose any extreme environmental challenge. So we could have good productivity and we could pass on our characteristics and some of our ability to our offspring. And offspring had a better chance of surviving in some of those less harsh living conditions. As we evolved, so did the microorganisms. And so they, we all change. The microorganisms change and adapt as well as we change and adapt. So we find that there are some parasites that have been with human beings for thousands of years. And one type or example could be the organism that causes malaria. It's a very sophisticated interaction between the organism that causes malaria and us. And that's an, a good example of a chronic long-term condition. When you're infected, depending upon what kind or strain of malaria that you get infected with, um, that can be a long-term condition. It can be, of course, fatal. And not all malaria is what we think of as a benign condition at all. It's a very serious condition, but the more successful parasites and pathogens um, often survive long enough to get passed to another host. And malaria has been very successful in being able to do that. Some of the newer interactions, every time we encounter a new microorganism um, that's not necessarily uh, benign in nature, for example, Ebola virus, um, that can lead to an acute short-term relationship that's highly volatile and what we would perceive as life-threatening because it does advance so rapidly and surmounts our immunity to devastate the human body. Ancient ages of man, if we take a look at some of the occurrences in the different stages or ages. And again, these are artificially created just for for discovery or scientific study. The Paleolithic hunter-gatherers and the Mesolithic had long-term stable relationships with their microorganisms. We get to the end of the last ice age, roughly 10 to 6,000 years ago, and we do start to see those changes in the development of what we think of as agriculture, domestication of plants and animals, and the establishment of then more permanent residences, because if you're going to plant crops, definitely you have to stay in one place. And that's when we start to see um, some of what we take for granted today. And part of the reason that we have cities and towns and villages goes all the way back to the invention of agriculture. And there are certain areas in the world that human beings were more successful at establishing those centers of what we think of as farming than others. A lot of it has to do with the types of animals and plants that were in those specific geographic locations. 
and one area on Earth that has an ideal geographic formula or complement of plants and animals and um, ideal weather conditions, sources of water, is what's called the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. It's an area of land between two rivers, and it's thought there were probably four at one time, but currently what's still visible today are two rivers called the Tigris and Euphrates. And they were still present around 10,000 years ago. Here's where we see the transition out of the Stone Age, the Neolithic, to what we think of as the sort of early historic um, era of human development. Roughly 6,000 BC to about 2,500 BC, we see that much of humanity is living in parts of the world that we would recognize today. Europe, Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, um, even the Americas, though we have less information about some of what was occurring in certain parts of the Americas. That information is also tr increasing tremendously. And it seemed to happen, um, not coincidentally, in all kinds of areas on Earth. Lots of geographic locations that roughly can, we're looking at within a few thousand years or so, but it seemed like because of changes in world, you know, climate and opportunities, many areas in the world we find similar activities occurring at roughly the same time. And that's the formation of these communal societies that we think of eventually as tribes, which even could be less nomadic than our even further ancient ancestors. So if we go back to some of the earlier communities, they do migrate perhaps from one area to another, but they stay within a fairly prescribed geographic location. It's not as if they're traveling from one continent to another. They're staying within a reasonably localized geographic location and possibly for some type of ritual, some type of memorial activity that they do. Unfortunately, even without armed conflict, if we take a look back roughly at the time a little before and after the last ice age, we still have problem of surviving. It's improving some, but there's still a very high infant mortality and maternal mortality. It was pretty risky business just to be alive, and it still was, um, even though it was less nomadic and less relying, less reliance on hunter-gathering kinds of activities. Um, and I'm sure actually that there was some overlap. It's not like there was a distinct a uh, sort of break point at which human beings switched immediately from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers, or just sort of depending on agriculture. It was a blending. It had to be. It had to be one of those transitions um, where there was less reliance on living day-to-day -day or week-to-week, -week and more dependence on having a long-term source of reliable food. And that's what we see in some of these prehistoric communities that established areas for people to cohabitate roughly 10,000 years ago or so. And then we start to see localized diseases that come and go within the same population. Whenever we see localized diseases that are persistent in a human population, we describe those as endemic diseases. So. Today, we see endemic diseases, for example, in the form of malaria in certain geographic locations on Earth. Or if you go to those parts of the world, you will see a particular prevalence of that disease all the time. 
in prehistoric times, in the late Neolithic, and into the early stages of prehistoric and historic human habitation, we do still see the problems of surviving due to challenges in health because of disease, as well as environmental challenges, because they still are constantly battling cold, droughts, heat, floods. Um, it's still a challenge, but less of a challenge because they now have a little bit more stability in their living 